Well, first, a little housekeeping. If anybody accidentally stumbled in here with the word containers, and this is not what they expected, I once had like a 15-minute conversation with a woman from IBM before either of us realized that she was talking about software containers and I was talking about physical containers. So get that out of the way. Good afternoon. I am Rob Coyle. I'm the director of sales at PCX. We're an off-site integrator. Uh, we build modular data centers. And we're going to talk today a little bit about why ISO containers are not a very good data center solution. It's not to say that they couldn't be used. They have been. We've been on a lot of successful projects with them. There's certainly applications where they could be applied. But the open compu uh, community is contagious. The idea of working together on something that can evolve and get better um, and attain the criteria of looking for efficiency, openness, scale, and impact doesn't really fit on a predetermined metal box. So who am I to talk to you about modular data centers? Construction's in my DNA. Those are actually pictures of me. The one on the left, my brother's a carpenter, my father's a carpenter, and my grandfather was a carpenter. So my DNA is construction. But my passion's technology. And I found a home in being able to do construction and technology at one place where I work today. PCX for over 25 years has been building modular systems for the commercial market, industrial applications, and increasingly over the last 15 years, data centers. We've stacked them three high, we've cut them apart, we've made them components as part of building blocks for a data center, separating power, compute, and cooling. There's an example there. So we've done a lot with ISO containers. So this isn't to persuade somebody to buy a different box. This is just sharing our experience and discovering that this might not be the best way forward. Our clients come to us for typically these things. Improved deployment speed, higher quality, and a more flexible solution. So we're always trying to hit those notes, but often the next question is, well, you guys do those containers. You do those metal boxes. And this is why. The expectations are that it's ready to go, it's easy to transport, and we're going to save a bunch of money because they're coming back over the ocean empty, so we're going to get them a discount anyways. The problem is they're not really ready. There's a lot that goes from making an ISO container a data center environment, because that's really what you're building. Transportation may have some upsides, but there's a lot of compromises involved. Oh. And savings is perceived, but we have to explore that a little bit deeper. And then we have to talk about what are we really saving. We're saving walls and a roof and a floor, maybe. So is it ready? This is an extreme example, but it took a lot just to get to this point and we're not in a data center environment yet. This has been used at least once, typically. It needs to be cleaned, modified, reinforced. If we're going to ship it using ISO equipment, it's going to need to be recertified. And then we're going to work within these confines to try and build this data center environment. There's also some things we have to consider depending on where we're deploying it. Our experience is mostly in North America. Um, things we run into most recently are ASHRAE 90.1 and the requirements from IECC. It's very prescriptive now if you are conditioning the space, regardless if it's being occupied, that you have to have continuous insulation. That means a couple things. One, where historically you could take some rock wool, slap it up against the side of a, uh, a container and then wrap it in sheet metal, doesn't really apply anymore. One, it's not a consistent R value throughout the entire enclosure. And if you're using fasteners that are metal, you've just created a conductive surface that is radiating the heat from outside to inside your facility or the heat that's inside back outside. It's not going to comply with these standards. And they're becoming more and more adopted uh, depending on where you're delivering. Not to mention, when you have to now insulate to those strict requirements, we're either changing the dimensions inside the enclosure or outside of it. So now we've, we've really stepped even further away from using the standardized 
ISO container. And now we're going to make a lot of compromises in using this metal box. Physical limitations associated with the equipment, what we can select, that may affect our budget and what we were going to try and put in this metal box to save this money. The National Electric Code has very prescriptive requirements on how far you have to be from conductive surfaces or other electrified surfaces. So now we have limitations in how we can lay out the gear within the room. And the NFPA is going to uh, put restrictions there in how many doorways, egress, other things we need to, uh, to meet those requirements and get them deployed where we need them. So now we're ready, maybe not really, but we're going to put this metal box on the truck and we're going to take it somewhere. Oh, we're going to save a bunch of money. We made a bunch of compromises. We used uh, different equipment than we wanted to. We didn't get as much compute space as we wanted, but that's okay because we're going to make it up when we start shipping these all over the world. Here's a pretty great example. One, because I have almost no visibility on an uh, on a deployment like this because we deliver in North America, so typically it leaves a truck in our facility, travels across the road, and gets dropped somewhere else. But this would really be a worst case scenario where you would think an ISO container would be a great application. The demand is a 5,000 square foot data center in inland in Nigeria. It has to leave from Vara, Sweden, so it has to leave the factory floor, get lifted onto a truck, drive to a port, get loaded onto a boat, travel across the ocean, unloaded from a boat onto a truck, and then deployed on site and offloaded there. So with all these touch points, it's logical to think that an ISO container would be a great application. But we're not moving boxes, we're moving compute. The demand isn't, I need X number of ISO containers, it's I need 5,000 square feet of data center space. So when developing a custom module that fits the road and fits the needs, we can use eight custom modules versus 15 ISO containers to achieve the same thing without compromise. In this example, they went out to Swedish modules, went out to three vendors to get transportation quotes. And in, from none of those three was the ISO container a cost advantage. So they're built to be moved, but not used. They're really not built for the contents. They're built to be the box. They're built for the equipment that moves them, not what's inside them. And the mobility is not worth the compromise in most applications. But OK, we made a bunch of compromises. Transportation may or may not work out. But we're going to save a bunch of money because they're just littered. They're, for, you know, they're so cheap. What are we talking about that's cheap? We're talking about the walls. We're talking about a data center environment with compute. Now, this is just historical data we kind of mashed together. But if you look at this scale from a big data center to a modular data center, it's not far off. We're trying to squeeze the smallest part and make a bunch of compromises on the rest of the pie. It doesn't even come into account when you build it. So all that modification to that ISO container is very restrictive. Sure, the raw material itself may or may not be cheaper, but to work inside that data center as it is is very hard. I can only put so many fabricators and electricians and technicians in that box. If the walls are open or if I have a manufacturing process with different material, I can work a lot more efficiently. Transportation doesn't really make much sense because we're not worried about moving boxes. We're worried about moving compute space or storage space. And the rigging and install in our experience is really no benefit either. So it's ready, just not as a data center. Transportation, the efficiencies have not been found. And the upfront wall savings are not worth the compromise in the total package. So that's why you wouldn't. Why would you want to build a regular modular data center? Why would you want a custom one? is that the intent informs the design, not the construction material. The resources we have, we're not limited to just using shipping containers. Especially in this part of the world, we can build with almost whatever we want. And this is what we're after, at least in the OCP. It's a great platform to be in a custom modular data center as opposed to an ISO container. 
the efficiency, the scale, the openness, and the impact that a custom modular data center can have reaches far beyond the limits of an ISO container. So we talked about our labor costs and what we were able to do. The manufacturing process in a custom modular data center is optimized, and the end user will see savings overall. Um, and we can evolve it for OCP components. We're early in the modular data center space. OCP is relatively early in what they're developing, although further along than we are. There's going to be a lot more that comes out of there. What a great world where we can change the envelope in what, uh, in what that equipment lives in. And we're on our way. Specifications for the 90KW and 300KW are live. You can go to the Wikipedia and look at them. I encourage you to look at them, dig into them. We're in the first phases of that. We want it to be um, more prescriptive and more, more specified, more um, particular, but it lays a great framework for more people to get involved at this stage, get more manufacturers involved, equipment manufacturers, other modular manufacturers, end users. It's a great place to start. Next, we have product on the horizon. Both Swedish modules and Schneider um, and PCX are all uh, in route to provide product to the marketplace. And then we can see how that product fits with the rest of the OCP environment. We'll evaluate it and we'll improve it. Here's some examples of what you can find online. This is the all-in-one Schneider Electric 90KW module. It's, uh, in this example, it's DX cooling, in-row coolers. You can see uh, the condensers outside. The, the way it was laid out was 2N redundant with generators, although that's not typically what you would see. You may see one or none and a transformer there. There's the layout we talked about. Because the width of the enclosure can feel like more of a traditional data center, hot aisle, cold aisle can be wider. You can meet all the code requirements. You can operate in that environment as you would in a traditional data center. You're not making compromises. The 300KW Swedish module is an expandable design. Excuse me, and these three show you about a um, one megawatt facility. And this is a uh, chilled water design. You can see the chilled water units and the generators. And their layout's a little bit different than the all-in-one. You have flexibility for scale. But again, you're still maintaining the larger hot aisle, cold aisle, so you can meet these code requirements. You can make the environment feel more familiar. So I encourage you to join us. There's the Wikipedia link, uh, the mailing list. Our group meets frequently, the first, second, and fourth Wednesday, um, only offset by the facilities group on the third Wednesday. So you're encouraged to join that as well. Um, and if, uh, if these links, it, it is confusing um, to get in there. And even when I started to get involved, I wasn't exactly sure who I'd reach out to or how do I get involved or what the process is. It helps to listen to some of the meetings ahead of time or just join one of our calls and listen. You're not going to be asked to stand up and tell us all about yourself. If you just want to listen and get involved, please do so. Um, or if you want help from me, please reach out to me. Uh, we'd be happy to get you guys involved. Thank you. Does anybody have any questions? Before I run away. Modular data centers in general, ISO containers in general. Does anyone want to throw an ISO container at me? Do you have something, Brevin? OK. Here, I'll bring you a mic. So are you interested in being the project lead for the modular data center subproject? <laughs> sure. <laughs> Is it, it'll put me on point, but yes. All right, I, I came in late, so you might have uh, oh, covered boy. this already. Um, That's not my fault. I know, I know. So you could just say we covered it already. Okay. Um, what What do you if you uh, if you alter an ISO container? What does it take to like get it recertified? Did you cover that type of thing? 
We touched on that. We have okay. to. Okay. If you're going to use it as an ISO container, right, right. Then yeah. yes, there's a recertification process. Yeah. Is that easy or hard? But it's a cost consideration for customers to. They want to stick it on a ship or something, right? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. It's definitely a cost consideration. The customer may not see the difficulty in it, but we'll charge them for it. Yeah, yeah. So not not straightforward. Cool. No, thank you. All right. With that, enjoy the rest of the summit.